So what are my objectives then uh, for my portion of the talk? And it's going to be very brief. Um, it's just going to stimulate hopefully some question and answers and I'll be available to answer questions afterwards as well. But I want to talk about the pathway that patients take from the beginning when they present with symptoms through to their referral to a specialist and then potentially some of the options that exist for them that I would provide and then we'll move on to the other disciplines that provide options. So we'll talk about that pathway and I'll try and see if we can help people navigate through that pathway. And I know many have already been through this path, but there might be some in the audience that are just about to embark on this pathway. So we'll try and demystify it for everyone. I will talk about some of the tests that are used to diagnose bladder cancer. And then once a diagnosis is made, what, how we stratify patients with bladder cancer, how we decide what treatments are available for them and what options exist for them. And then I'll talk about a few recent changes to how we manage bladder cancer. Now, unfortunately, as we'll talk about tonight, there's not been a lot of change in the management of bladder cancer over the last few decades. And really, there's not been significant advances like we've seen in many other cancers like breast cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer. So we're still relatively in the dark ages and bladder cancer still is what we consider an orphan cancer site with not a lot of research activity and not a lot of new um, things that have changed in the management. Certainly Bladder Cancer Canada has had their hand in this and uh, recently we awarded a number of research grants from Bladder Cancer Canada nationally to allow for research to continue in bladder cancer specifically and so I applaud them for that and that's one of the uh, reasons that I'm here tonight. So what is bladder cancer? Bladder cancer is a cancer that arises from the lining of the bladder and that's why obviously it's called bladder cancer. But that lining that lines the bladder, it's called urothelium or transitional cell epithelium, that also lines many other aspects of the, the tract that drains the urine out of the body. So it lines the kidney, it lines the drainage from the kidney of the bladder called the ureter, it lines the bladder and also lines the urethra. So cancers can occur in anywhere along that path of drainage. So not necessarily only in the bladder. The majority of these cancers arise in the bladder and that's because the urine stays in the bladder for the most of the time that the urine is stored so it has a longer dwell period in the bladder and uh, because of that bladder tends to get more of the cancers but still the urothelium in the lining from the kidney all the way down to the tip of the urethra can be involved and so that there, we consider all of these urothelial cancers and they all behave relatively similarly because of their common, common origin. <clears throat> we call it a field defect when these cells are exposed to things that promote cancer and um, that gives the risk of people getting cancer. So cancer is, uh, bladder cancer is a very common cancer. There's over 5,000 new cases annually in Canada. There's a significant number of people dying of bladder cancer as well, which is something that we're trying to specifically have an impact on. And like I said, we haven't had as great of an impact as we had with other cancer sites over the last number of years. It's the fourth most common cancer in men and the eighth in women. So it is certainly something that occurs very commonly in people and comprises 2% of all cancers and there's still a male to female predominance but that's changing with the face of smoking and the way smoking has kind of infiltrated our youth and now many more women at young ages are smoking more than men and uh, this will potentially have an impact of possibly changing the male to female predominance. The lifetime risk is also not insignificant when you think of all cancers. So the risk factors I already alluded to, the number one risk factor for bladder cancer is smoking, obviously something that we've talked about for lung cancer and you know, when we buy cigarettes, we see these cancerous lungs and x-rays and things like that on the package. We don't often hear though that bladder cancer is caused by smoking and it's the number one cause of bladder cancer. And we don't see cigarette packages having these kind of pictures of somebody who doesn't have a bladder or a, piece, a, porcelain, a picture of a cancerous bladder or even a picture of a patient's abdomen when they're draining the urine from their ostomy related to bladder cancer surgery. These things potentially could have an impact on people smoking and picking up the habit. What we think happens is the <clears throat> the smoke goes into the system, it gets into your bloodstream after it goes through your lung, then it gets the, you know, the toxins in the smoke get filtered in the urine, and then they sit in your bladder for long periods of time. We know these toxins in smoke are, are cancer causing or so-called carcinogens. They bathe the cells that line the bladder and then over time you can get the risk of bladder cancer. Having said that, however, many people who've never smoked can get bladder cancer and some people can also get bladder cancer from inhaling secondhand smoke occupationally, uh, you know, people who worked in a smoke environment when smoking was permitted in restaurants and things, those people are also at high risk even though they weren't smokers personally. There's also many occupational exposures, so many people that are exposed to things like dyes and pesticides and textiles, certainly those occupations are at risk, so painters and hairdressers and mechanics and, you know, many other people who are exposed to these kind of toxins in the workplace can potentially manifest bladder cancer down the road. There's been some implications with using things like anti-inflammatory medications like aspirin type medications that can also be a risk factor and there's been a certain number of these that have been taken off the market because they've been found to cause bladder cancer. Um, there's been some chemotherapies that have been used in the past uh, 
like cyclophosphamide-based chemotherapies that are used in children to treat things like childhood cancers, and then they have a lifelong risk of developing bladder cancer down the road. People who get radiation to their pelvis also would be at risk for cancer. And then uh, we've been seeing this a little more commonly in the recent past, especially with our uh, northern population that gets exposed to tuberculosis quite a bit. They're at risk for getting bladder cancer related to bladder TB that they can get. So tuberculosis of the bladder is not an uncommon manifestation of tuberculosis, and that's also a risk factor. How do patients then present with the first signs, potentially, that there's a warning of bladder cancer? Well, the most common thing is called hematuria, or blood in the urine. And so that's the most common symptom or sign that a patient will come to their doctor with, and then their doctor should investigate that and fully investigate that. So uh, we've actually even mandated, as a, our Canadian Urologic Association, in certain high-risk populations, screening for blood in the urine after a certain age. So in you know, males over 50, uh, who, especially who smoke, they should have an annual screen for blood in the urine. And most family doctors now are doing that on an annual basis with their patients once they read that, reach that age, making sure that there's no evidence of microscopic blood in the urine, which shouldn't be, should be investigated. If there's gross blood in the urine, that's an ominous warning sign, and that should be definitely reported to the family doctor, and that should be followed up on as well. If we look at the hematuria screening or the blood in the urine screening, we can see that a significant portion of men will have that, almost up to a quarter will have that when they're over 50. And almost a quarter of those could be related to cancers either of the kidney or the bladder or anywhere along that drainage system. So it's not insignificant, and these are certainly ways of us finding this cancer early and then hopefully trying to beat the cancer. And the majority of the cancers that cause hematuria are bladder cancers. What are the symptoms that a patient would complain of when they potentially have the risk of bladder cancer? Well, <clears throat> most often relegated to symptoms of what the bladder does, which is holds urine and voids urine. So you have a frequency of going to the bathroom, the urgency to go to the bathroom, which can be quite dramatic, pain when you go to the bathroom as well. Uh, if there's a bladder tumor sitting in the drainage of the bladder, in the urethra, or at the bladder neck, you can have obstruction avoiding, so you try and pass your water and you can't pass your water. And occasionally, if the tumors are in a location where they block the kidney drainage systems into the bladder, you can have pain like a kidney stone passing uh, and some obstruction there called hydronephrosis. So these are also possible symptoms of bladder cancer. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, we like referrals from, you know, so patients report these symptoms and signs to their family doctors and their primary care physicians refer them to a specialist who looks at specifically the risk of bladder cancer and investigates bleeding in the urine or these symptoms. So we think that certainly gross blood in the urine certainly mandates an immediate referral and investigation. Microscopic hematuria upon repetitive measures also should be investigated. So what we would do then, we would send off a specimen of the urine for a cytology test that would look at the specific makeup of the cells that are shed in the urine, and often cancer cells will be shed in the urine. So we'll look at their cytology to see what that shows. We'll also get some form of imaging of the kidney to make sure that there's no evidence of cancer in the kidney or in the drainage system of the kidney, and that can be achieved through an ultrasound or a CAT scan or an MRI scan. <clears throat> Finally, to complete the workup of this blood in the urine, we would take a, a little telescope and we'd take a look into the bladder, and it's called a cystoscopy test. And this is what a you know, real crude representation of what a cystoscopy is, and I know many people probably have had that done, but it's a little telescope that we put into the, through the uh, urethra into the bladder, and we look in the bladder. So you can see on the right side here, the cystoscopy on your, on your left side and on, on this side here, the actual bladder tumor that can be seen in the bladder. And it kind of looks almost like a, a coral reef that we see in there. And this is very pathognomonic appearance of a bladder cancer. When we see this, we can say pretty much unequivocally this is a bladder cancer. So we make our diagnosis based on looking. And then what we do to confirm the diagnosis and to remove the tumor is called a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor, or a TURBT, where we take another telescope. It has an electrocautery loop on the end, and we resect that tumor as completely as possible. So that allows us to get the diagnosis. It also allows us to stage the bladder cancer as to its invasiveness. So is it invading into the wall of the bladder that's superficial? Is it invading into the deeper level of the bladder, into the muscle? And this is really important for us to decide on treatment options. So we really need to know the diagnosis. We need to know the, the stage of the tumor, so how de deep it's growing. And then we also, with the pathology from this, we'll get the grade of the cancer, which will also help us to decide how aggressive this cancer is. It helps us to decide on treatment options and also how to follow the patients. This requires an anesthetic, usually a spinal or regional anesthetic and um, we, can, we can basically grade and stage based on this. And this is a diagram of the staging of bladder cancer that I alluded to. So you know, there's superficial bladder cancer that can be papillary, it's called TA, bladder cancer. Very superficial, usually that's low grade. Those are more nuisance type bladder cancers 
there's a flat cancer called carcinoma in situ or this TIS type cancer that's not invasive but it's high grade and it is a risky cancer because down the road this could become invasive and be life-threatening so that really has to be dealt with aggressively. Um, does not require bladder removal per se at that point. But then there's the deeper tumors, there's the T2 tumors that invade the muscle, the T3 tumors that invade the fat outside of the bladder, and the T4 tumors that invade other structures such as the pelvic side walls, the rectum, and things like that. These are the really nasty type bladder cancers. Fortunately, we don't see those as often as we see the more superficial ones. Now, how do we treat those superficial bladder cancers? I have alluded to their natural history or how they behave. They're a relatively indolent type of tumor. Uh, often they're more of a nuisance than they are of a, threat, a life threatening kind of illness. The majority of them are these TA, these papillary tumors. They look like little finger projections growing out of the bladder. They don't invade the deep tissue of the bladder, so they're very superficial. Most often we just resect those and then we follow people on a surveillance pattern. If they have risk factors that can be modified to change their recurrence rates, like smoking, we counsel them on smoking cessation, which is very important. So if you have a superficial bladder cancer and you're smoking, well, we can say if you stop smoking, your recurrence risk is going to be a lot less than if you continue to smoke. And so at that point, we try and offer that advice to patients. Um, if the disease is a high-grade papillary lesion, in that case, we won't only resect and follow up. We'll also resect plus give one dose of chemotherapy into the bladder at the time of resection. And we may also prescribe six weeks of some treatment in your bladder, either chemotherapy or another agent that we'll talk about in a second to try and treat that higher grade superficial tumor. Now this is that special instance of that, that thing called carcinoma in situ, that's the flat high grade bladder cancer that's not yet invasive. This is a warning sign that essentially if it's left unchecked, this could become a deeply invasive cancer that potentially could spread elsewhere and be life threatening. So when we see these, we take them very seriously because they need to be acted on aggressively. So what we do is we make the diagnosis by biopsy and then we would, um, take a look in the bladder and see the extent of disease. We would then prescribe a treatment in the bladder called intravesical therapy, which is, which is a treatment called in, in the bladder treatment. Once every six weeks, we'd give an agent, and usually the agent we give is an immunotherapy. It's not a chemotherapy. It stimulates the patient's own immune system to attack these flat cancer cells that line the bladder and get rid of them. The agent's called BCG. It's, a, it's something that probably you guys are familiar with from getting vaccinations for, for TB. A really brilliant urologist from Canada actually discovered this in the 70s, that if you put this into bladders of patients with this flat cancer, he could get a specific immune response that's an anti-cancer response, which makes the patient's own body remove the cancer in the bladder. So we also found coincidentally that he was exactly right with the six-week installations. Um, the reason he chose six weeks is because when he ordered this from the distributor, it came in six vials. So he thought, well, we'll give them six doses. Turns out it was serendipity, but we know that if we give more than six, we cause immunosuppression. If we give less than six, we don't get the maximal response. So we give six weeks worth of this, and then we recheck with the cytology. Um, we get the patient to pass their water. We look under the microscope. If there's no cancer cells remaining, we're really happy. We'll take a look in the bladder again, make sure it's clear, and we'll follow up with surveillance after that at certain time points. Um, the majority of patients now, though, will go on to something called maintenance therapy, which means the induction of six weeks, and then for three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, they'll get three more weeks of treatment that'll help intermittently stimulate the immune system, preventing any further recurrences. And we found that we can reduce the recurrence risk based on that. So we've really now are starting to use maintenance therapy a lot more. If patients fail this therapy, then there's very few options left. There's some other treatments that we can give. There's some chemotherapies. There's something that we combine with BCG called interferon, but the response rates are not great. And so most often, if this does not respond, it's a kind of harbinger of bad acting disease and then we would offer removal of the bladder at that point. Now when we get to things that are more high grade but invasive, uh, like the high grade superficial T1 grade 3 lesions we call them, the high grade cancers that are the ones that are bad actors, and if we also get to the higher stage tumors like T2 to T4, often surgical removal is the only recourse at that point. And this is you know, a very aggressive, obviously aggressive management, but even when we choose the appropriate patients who we think have only localized cancer, we're not doing the greatest job curing them. We're, we're picking them when we think we can actually cure them, but only at five years we're curing 50% of those patients when we think we can cure them. And that's where we're really not having the best outcomes that we would desire with this cancer, unlike other cancer sites that we're doing much better with. So you know, even with the best preoperative testing, we're still losing 50% of these people at five years when we would hope that we could cure all of them. Um, what, the, what the treatment here is, it's called radical cystectomy. In men, it involves removing the prostate, the bladder. The, the prostate's removed because it sits on the bladder. 
It also surrounds the urethra, and it's a, it's a risk of recurrent cancer if you leave it behind because it's so intimately associated with the bladder. We may also have to remove the urethra in certain men um, because there could be cancer in that urethra, that lining that drains the, drains the bladder. So occasionally it's, it's, it's often bladder and prostate. Occasionally it can also be bladder, prostate, and urethra removed. We also remove all the local lymph nodes. And then once that's all removed, we have to decide on a way of draining their kidneys to get a diversion performed. In women, it's a little more intensive because it involves removing the bladder, the urethra, potentially. Also, often we remove the uterus and the ovaries and do a hysterectomy alongside because the, those pelvic organs are very associated with the bladder and can be a source of recurrent disease. So that also can be something that has to be removed. So it turns out to be a very, very large and aggressive surgery for someone to tolerate. And um, it does offer the best chance of cure for those localized disease uh, patients and that are younger and able to tolerate things. But once again, it's a very aggressive approach. Now, the way we divert the urine once we're done, we have to figure out a way of having people pass their water. There's usually two broad categories. There's a way of making a, a continent diversion that we put in the spot of the bladder so that you empty normally through the urethra. And there's a way of doing it where we divert the kidney drainage into a segment of bowel that goes to the skin that's a, a cutaneous diversion. So these are the two broad categories that we have. The uh, one side is the neobladder, where we actually use about 70 centimeters of the small bowel. We fold it into a sphere. We hook the kidneys up to that. We hook it back up to the urethra. And you void the normal, ch normal direction from kidneys down through urethra. The other option is with an ileal conduit, which is a smaller segment of bowel. We hook the ureters up to that, and then we hook that up to the skin. That goes to an ostomy appliance, and then you drain that way. So, you know, in general, I think in Canada, we looked at our data on this, um, and we found that we're underutilizing the neobladders in patients, and especially in female patients. We're not doing as many as we should be. And so that's something that we're trying to change, and we're trying to offer this now much more commonly. The only problem is that not a lot of doctors are trained to do these kind of surgeries. So as more doctors get trained in doing them, I think it's going to become more widespread. Until then, we'll be using the ileal conduit as the more standard option. Now, the only real advancement we've made in the management in the last couple of decades is adding chemotherapy to the surgery to try and make the cure better. And we use it in a so-called neoadjuvant approach, which we would deliver the chemotherapy prior to surgery, and it, we think, makes our surgery better and more likely to cure patients. And if you look at this data, it had 2,500 patients. You can see these two curves. The upper curve represents a better survival. We found that there was about a 5% absolute benefit in survival with the chemotherapy beforehand. Now, you know, that might not be too great, but certainly that's the only advance that we have that helps these patients. And if we're only looking at a 50% five-year survival, a 55% is better. We save five more patients per 100 patients with the addition of this. So now we're trying to use this as much as possible. When you look at bladder cancer-specific survival, so living five years with no cancer occurrence, it comes up to 9% benefit. And so Joel will be talking about this. But this is really the only advancement we've really had in the management of bladder cancer in the last few decades. Here's a specimen that I removed and just kind of harkens to how aggressive the surgical approach can be. If you look at the top of this, that's a kidney. The drainage system is going down to the bladder. The bladder is sitting there. The prostate's right below that. The urethra is that long tube coming out, and then there's a catheter going into the bladder there. So we removed essentially from the kidney down to the tip of the penis because that was a significant source of cancer for one patient. And so that just tells you how, how aggressive our surgical approach is because we really want to cure this disease if it's possible. So then when we do all of these curative intent surgeries, what is our outcomes? Well, our outcomes are based on the stage of presentation. Um, we know that early stage cancers are cured most of the time. When we get to those later stage where we're in involving muscle, the fat outside the bladder or other organs, our cure rates are, are quite poor. And that's why we're looking at you know, new areas and avenues of research to try and improve these outcomes. So although these outcomes aren't as good as some other cancer sites, there's some great things potentially on the horizon, hopefully for bladder cancer. So just in conclusion, then, smoking cessation is very important, and I would strongly suggest anyone who's dealing with bladder cancer can consider smoking cessation, uh, potentially helping their bladder cancer get better. Um, it's a very common cancer that's kind of under-recognized um, in the population and certainly doesn't get as much press as many other cancers get, so certainly a night like this is really helping promote that, and it's very important. So early presentation to family doctors and then early referral to me from the family doctor is very important to try and catch these cancers early on. Um, when we give these treatments in your bladder, the intravesical treatments that are going on for six weeks, we should always consider those appropriate patients for the maintenance therapy because that's something that we have in our back pocket that can improve outcomes. And then there's these advances with our surgical management by the addition of the chemotherapy that 
is given up front that Joel will talk to about, about as well, which is really one of the only other significant advances we made, as I mentioned. So thank you very much.